Hello everyone and welcome to the test review for the test that is happening on Wednesday on all the topics that are listed on this pretty little document she has put in Schoology for us. So today I'm just going to be going through down the list these topics and I'm going to be explaining them to the best of my ability. I am only going to do the ones that she has highlighted because I'm assuming that those are the only ones that are going to be on the test. Uh, I don't know how fast I speak, but it might be worth your time to watch this video on one and a half times speed or something because I assume that there's going to be a lot of content and a lot of talking and I want you to be able to watch this video and get as much out of it as you can. I don't know what to expect for this test. It is going to be on paper. Just do your best, you know, like, let's just, let's do it, okay? So without wasting too much of our time, let's just jump right into it. So 4.7, 4.1.U7 is asking us to define species, population, and community, and it has got a sentence here that explains it pretty well. A community is formed by populations of different species living together and interacting with one another. So species are going to be any group of organisms who can create fertile offspring. So what do I mean by that? Well, horses are a species because they can mate with other horses and have fertile offspring. And mules are a species because they can mate and have fertile offspring. But when horses and mules mate, they have a donkey, and donkeys are infertile, and that means they are not technically a species. Moving up from species, a population is a group of species, members of a species that live in a particular area. That's a population. And a community is going to be a group of these populations living and interacting together. So next, let's define abiotic and ecosystem. And this is 4.1.U8. Abiotic is going to be any non-living part of an ecosystem. And an ecosystem is going to be the community and abiotic relation, like abiotic things that are working together to interact and exist. So to read the sentence it's got right here, a community forms an ecosystem by its interactions with the abiotic environment. And the easiest way for me to remember that abiotic is non-living is when you think of biology, you naturally think of living things. That's the study of biology, plants and animals and all that fun stuff. Abiotic is going to be the opposite of biology. So instead of all the living things, we're looking at all the non-living things. And again, this ecosystem is going to form, be formed by the community and its interactions with the abiotic environment. So next, we are going to talk about 4.1.S2, and this is asking us about chi-squared. So I'm going to jump over to the PowerPoint that she showed us in class to talk about chi-squared because I think it's the easiest way to go through it. So if you think you've got chi-squared, you can just skip to where I'm not talking about this anymore, and that'll be great. If you want to hear me talk about chi-squared for a little bit, then keep listening. So in order to use chi-squared, we need to use categorical data. So this is anything that is a finite number versus continuous data, which has numeric numbers. So a temperature is going to be numeric. It's going to be continuous. It can range anywhere from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. These are too many. Whereas categorical data is yes or no. Is a species present or is it not present? Is the species green or is it brown? Is, the, is a certain gene there or is it not? It's usually yes or no. Yes, yes, it's there. Yes, it's green. Yes, it's brown. Or no, it's not green or whatever, right? So that's the kind of thing that we're looking at for chi-squared. We want categorical data. So in order to use chi-squared, we need both a null and an alternate hypothesis. Our null hypothesis is going to say that there is no relationship between the species. So this just means that it is totally random whether these two things go together. So if I said, what is the rate of listening to music and standing next to a plant and that plant falling over? Those things are not related. 
And therefore, that would be a null hypothesis if we said there is no relationship between the two. So null hypothesis is not necessarily stupid things going together like that, but it is just going to be random things going together. And then we're also going to have an alternative hypothesis. So this is going to say that there is an association between two species. So this is usually what we think of as just our hypothesis. But when we use chi-squared, it's going to be called our alternative hypothesis. So there's either a positive association, so species A does associate with species B, or there's a negative association, where species A does not associate with species B. And please keep in mind that this is different than a null hypothesis, because a null hypothesis says there is no relationship, whereas a negative association alternative hypothesis says specifically that they do not associate. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and skip over this example because we don't really need to go through it. If you want to go through that, you can do it on your own. But let's look at this table that we're building. So we are going to have four little squares here in the middle. So it's going to be quadrants with A present, quadrants with A not present, quadrants with B present, and this is where they're intersecting, and quadrants with B not present. So this should be they're both present, and this should be neither of them is present. And so we're just going to go ahead and fill in that data. And then we've got our, this is called our observed values. So this is exactly what we see. And then you can add them up and get the total for the columns and the rows. And in this case scenario, everything totals together to be 100. So 61, 69 plus 31 is 100, and 54 and, thir and 46 are both 100. So now the way we are going to find out the actual chi-squared value is we're going to look at our expected frequency. So this is going to be our column total times our row total divided by the number of quadrants. So our number of quadrants is going to be the number that we just talked about, the 100. So that's going to be our 100. So we're, for each specific box we are looking at, for example, this first box is going to be 69 times 54 divided by 100. And when we fill that in, we're going to get some interesting numbers that are probably going to be decimals, but again, that's going to be this number times this number divided by this number, and, and that's going to be our blue number. And then this times this is going to be our, divided by this is going to be our red, and you get it, so on and so forth. And that's how we get our expected frequencies. So what does this mean? This means that if we were looking at our null hypothesis, and again, this means that there is no association, then this is the values we would expect to see in the table. So then what we're going to do is if you add all these numbers back together the same way we did before, you would still get the same column and row totals. So we had 69 and 31, we had 54 and 46, and that is still going to be 100. So these are the exact same numbers we originally had, except now we're looking at our expected totals. Now we can find our chi-square value. So we are going to look at the summation of this pretty little equation here. Now what do I mean by this? It's a little bit complicated, so let's just do it simply. We are going to be taking our original value, so this is the value that we had in the table, minus the value we just got, our expected value, divided by that, ex both of those, sorry, our original value minus our expected value, square that number that we get, and then divide it by our expected value again. And this is going to look at our chi-square value. And then, so we're going to do that for each of our four little boxes here. And then we are going to sum them all together, and that sounds really scary, but that just means you add them. So 0 0.1, 0 0.01 plus 0 0.03 plus 0 0.02 plus 0 0.03 is going to be 0 0.09. So again, just to go back and go over this one more time, we are going to take our original minus our expected, subtract the two, square that, and divide it by our expected. Then we're going to take all four numbers that we get for each box, we are going to add them all together and get our calculated x squared value. So when we do a 2 by 2, which is what we're looking at here, and I assume what we will be doing every single time we ever look at chi-square, we will have one degree of freedom. Well, what does that mean? 
That means when we go down to this chart, when we look at the percentage points of the chi-square distribution, we are going to look at the single degree of freedom, and we will always use the 0 0.05 for this class. So that is 3.84. What does 3.84 mean? That means that if the calculated value is lower than that 3.84 or the 0 0.05 level of significance, then there is no, associ no significant association. But if it is higher than that 3.84, which again is right here on this table, then there is a significant association. And significant just means that the statistical significance is the likelihood that the result is not due to random chance. Again, just random things happening. If we get above that 3.84 for that added chi-square number that we had gotten before, that means that there is a chance that it's logical. In this case scenario, 0 0.09 is lower than the critical chi-squared value of 3.84 at the 0 0.05 level of significance, and that means that there is a null hypothesis. We accept the null hypothesis. So that's everything I'm going to go over for the chi-squared. If you still have questions after that, feel free to DM me on Discord, because I think I understand this pretty well, even if I'm not explaining it very well here, because I'm kind of trying to rush just a little bit. So then let's continue on with the original paper that we've been going through, and let's move on down to 4.2.U2. So this is just saying that light energy is converted to chemical energy in carbon compounds by photosynthesis. And what does this mean? This just means photosynthesis happens. I think we can do that. The only thing on this entire paper I'm going to be covering that isn't highlighted is right here, right now. And so if you want to skip this, please feel free to do so. But I'm just going to go over very briefly what we're looking at here. And that's just the definition of four words. Autotrophs are going to be organisms that make their own food. So this is like what we think about plants because they do the photosynthesis and take the sunlight and make it into food and carbon compounds. We have heterotrophs, which are going to be organisms that eat other living organisms for food. We are an example of a heterotroph. We cannot just magically use the sun to make food. We have to eat other things like plants and animals and chemicals in our case, because humans, you know? And then most importantly here, and the reason why I wanted to go over this at all, is because of the detritivores and the saprotrophs. And why I'm choosing to define these is because they are probably new terms for you, and they mean very similar things. Both of these are organisms that feed on dead organic material. What do I mean by that? Well, a mushroom is a really good example of a saprotroph, because a mushroom does not digest internally. So a mushroom will look at all the dead leaves on the ground, or the dead organic material, and gobble it up, eat it up, but it will not digest it internally. Instead, it'll break it down before it consumes it. The difference between that and a detritivore is that the detritivore will digest internally. So that's, that's just the difference. So if you want to think detritivore has a D and so does digest, I think that's a great way to think about it. And that's really, I think, all we would ever need to know. But, you know, we can always come back to this if people have questions. Moving right along to 4.2.U3, chemical energy in carbon compounds flows through food chains by means of feeding. So this is kind of a weird way to put this, but we're just going to go through the bullet points instead, and that'll get the right idea. So what is a food chain? Well, God help us all, I really hope we know what food chains are at this point, but just in case you don't, that is going to be the direction in which energy passes through a food chain or a food web or the linkage of animals that eat other animals. So if I have a carrot that's going to be an autotroph, I would draw an arrow from the carrot to the bunny that eats the carrot because that is the passage of energy. And then I would draw an arrow from the bunny to the fox, because that is the passage of energy as the fox eats the bunny. 
So I hope that kind of explains what a food chain is if you didn't know. That's a really easy thing to Google in case you still don't understand. The meaning of the arrow is going to be the passage of energy that is going to be the direction that energy is passing. And then a food chain, we could just do what I just did. So the producer is going to be the carrot, the primary consumer would be the bunny, the tertiary consum the secondary consumer would be the fox, and then the tertiary consumer would be something that eats a fox. I don't know, but you get the, you get the point. And it's not super difficult to think of animals that eat other animals. Moving right along to 4.2.U4. Energy from, released from carbon compounds by respiration is used in living organisms and converted to heat. This should make sense to you because if we have carbon compounds in our body, yes, we're going to break them down, yes, we're going to use them for energy, and yes, they're going to be converted to heat afterwards. Kind of a simple concept, not a whole lot to explain there. 4.2.U4 state, or 4.2.U5 states that living organisms cannot convert heat to other forms of energy. And this is going to go right along to kind of what we were talking about before with the food chain, how the energy will flow from the autotroph to the primary consumer to the secondary consumer, so on and so forth. And then the other part of inform information that they want you to gather here is that, excuse me, The other part of information that they want you to gather here is that only 10% of energy, let me say it again, 10% of energy, only 10% of energy is going to make it from the first level to the second level. From the second level, 10% of that energy is going to make it to the third level or this, whatever. You get the point. 10% each time, 10% each time. That's it. Where does the rest of it go? The majority of it is lost to heat. If you ever go near anyone or if you hug your pet, if you have a cat like Mittens and you hug Mittens the cat, Mittens is going to be warm. That's an example of energy that is being lost. Organisms cannot take that energy and convert, convert it to other forms of energy. That's not possible. Therefore, it is going to be lost from the ecosystem because the ecosystem cannot convert it into a usable form of energy. Does that mean it is lost forever? No. However, it's probably not going to be talked about here because this is biology and we're really just dealing with the ecosystem. So, moving on to 4.2.U7, energy losses between trophic levels restrict the length of food chains and the biomass of higher trophic levels. Define biomass. Biomass is going to be the physical amount of mass in each trophic level. So for example, if we have 365,000 blades of grass, that would be our biomass. If we put that on a nice little scale, that's our biomass. But then if we move up from that and we have 26 mice that eat those 365 blades of grass, then that would be our biomass for the next level and so on and so forth. And so as we go up the levels, we're going to lose biomass. And that means that as we go from the primary level, let me, let's pull up this nice little diagram. Not that one, this one. As we go up from levels, we're going to lose biomass. So here we might start with 100,000 pounds of biomass. But as we go up to the next level, as we lose 10%, or as we only transfer 10%, did I say lose 10% early? I hope I didn't. It's transfer 10%. Only 10% moves up. As we move up, 10% of the energy, 10% of the biomass is only going to be sustained. Think about it this way. If, huh, what's a good example for this? If I give everyone here that is imaginarily in this classroom that I'm teaching to right now. A quarter. If I give everyone a dollar and you all go out and buy 90 cent things, you will all have 10 cents to give back to me. Now, 
if there's 10 people, now I still have a dollar and I can still go out and buy one 90 cent item, but then there's only 10, per, 10 cents left over. That's not a really good way to explain it, so I don't know why I tried to do it that way. But the biomass or the physical amount of weight in each trophic level, and a trophic level is going to be each of the levels. So here's a trophic level, the plankton, the algae, the, fight, the seagrass, that's one trophic level where we have 1,000 pounds of biomass is going to transfer 10% of its biomass, 10% of its energy to this first order consumers or the second trophic level where there is now only going to be 100 pounds of queen conch, Atlantic blue tang, and zooplankton. From there, 10% is going to make it up to these secondary consumers, and I realize it says intermediate, secondary consumers, which is the third trophic level, and there's only going to be 10 pounds of barjack, black grouper, and yellowtail snapper, and from there, as 10% of the energy and 10% of the biomass goes up, there's only going to be one pound of gray reef shark and blue fin tuna. Why does this limit the trophic levels, the food chains? Because when you get to only one pound of shark, that one pound is going to be 0.1 pound. That's not sustainable. And there's going to reach a point where the, you just can't sustain any animals anymore on that level of biomass, that level of energy, because you're losing 90% and only transferring 10% every time. Going back over to this page, the unit for communicating, I don't know that. I hope we don't need to know that because I don't know that. <laughs> Three reasons why the amount of energy decreases. Lost food to digest, to digest in. It's pooped out and it's lost and it's gone. Heat is another big one. Moving around, that's going to use energy, that's going to lose, lose energy. There you go. There's your three reasons. The average amount of energy passed is just going to be 10%. Quantitative representations describe the shape... I can type really good. Did you see that? I hope you saw that. KCAL. Okay, KCAL. Great. So if we have 90,000 KCAL, we're going to go to 9,000 KCAL, to 900 KCAL, to 90 KCAL, to 9 KCAL. That's just how it works. It's going to be 10% every time. Pick a number, erase a zero. It's going to be in KCALs. So... You know, there we go. And it doesn't matter. Like, make it up. Who cares? You can do it. I promise. Just use KCALs. Erase a zero every time you go up a level. Bing, bang, boom. You got it. I promise you're going to do great. The supply of inorganic nutrients is maintained through nutrient cycling. So there are going to be, mm, like, three main different nutrient cycles going on at any given time. Nitrogen is one. Carbon is one. I can't remember the other, but it's there. Water is another type of cycling, but I don't think that's a nutrient, so we won't count that. Nitrogen and carbon are going to be our most important. Chemical elements can be recycled. Energy cannot be recycled because, again, when we lose that energy to heat, we aren't going to be able to recycle it back in the ecosystem because that is not a capability organisms have. So that is going to be lost energy, and we can't recycle that the same way we can nitrogen and carbon. Outline, outline the generalized flow of nutrients between the abiotic and biotic components of an ecosystem. Looky here, I've got a beautiful carbon cycle, and I even outlined, like you can tell how much effort I put into this. Okay, let's talk about it. What is going to be the biggest natural sink of Carbon, I don't remember, living organisms, trees, organic, or the biggest organic sink, I guess, is going to be living organisms, if that's an option. Trees are a really big one, forests. Technically, the ocean 
is an inorganic sink and it's inorganic because it's not living and the atmosphere is going to be inorganic because it is not living. But there are also going to be really big sinks of carbon. So here we've got our carbon cycle. We've got our sunlight, which is spurring on photosynthesis. As these beautiful trees die, it is going to go into the ground and up to auto and factory emissions. So we, it is turned into coal and then burned. And when it is burned, it goes into the atmosphere. Respiration, which is done by trees and or organisms, animals, is just going to be that taking of taking of oxygen and using it and doing cellular respiration and it is going to go back out of our bodies as CO2 back into the atmosphere. And again, when animals and humans die, we decompose and that is going to be turned back into coal, ideally, and right back out into factory emissions. So humans have a really big handle on the way that carbon is cycled through the ecosystem, right? But as long as you can kind of detail the fact that there's respiration going on, there's photosynthesis going on, and that humans have a hand in this, you can do it. It'll be great, I promise. So, moving right along, carbon dioxide diffuses from the atmosphere or water into autotrophs. So this is going to be through the process of photosynthesis because part of photosynthesis is we take the sunlight, we take the water, we take the carbon dioxide in either the ocean if you're underwater or the atmosphere if you're not, and we smush it all together and make ourselves some glucose and some oxygen. Right? We know this. It's, cellular res it's uh, the process of cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Autotrophs can convert carbon dioxide into carbohydrates and other carbon compounds. That's what we just talked about, isn't it? Photosynthesis. I stopped saying the numbers of these things, but you're fine. You understand. Photosynthesis. Again, we're going to take the water. We're going to take the, the carbon dioxide in either the ocean or the air, and we are going to turn it into a beautiful carbon compound called glucose, which is c 6 h 12 o two or something like that, or O6, I think it is. Glucose is uh, an example of a carbon compound. It is a carbohydrate, and it's what we make using photosynthesis. Isn't that great? Moving along to peat. So this is 4.3.U7 if you're attempting to follow along and not because I totally stopped saying the numbers like an idiot. Peat is going to be what I would define as kind of like pre-coal. So, in usually swampy areas where there are waterlogged soils and there's a lot of water but not like an ocean, kind of more like a swamp where it's just a lot of soil and it's waterlogged, there is going to be acidic conditions, which means that the pH is going to be very low, I believe is acidic, is low, and anaerobic conditions, which means that there is no little to no oxygen in this waterlogged soil water situation. Here, if an animal or a plant dies, it's going to be surrounded by this acidic anaerobic waterlogged soil and is not going to be able to fully decompose. And there's going to be pressure applied to it because of this waterlogged soil. And that's kind of going to form peat. And that's just going to be part of the process of how eventually coal is formed, but more importantly right now, that's how peat is formed. And in case you're ever asked this, that's actually why coal is such a finite resource, because it is very difficult to make peat, like very specific conditions to make peat and eventually coal, because coal is really just peat with more pressure. That's my understanding at least. Moving along to 4.3.2.A2, analysis of data from air monitoring stations to explain annual fluctuations. Why is there an annual fluctuation in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration in the northern hemisphere? Well, sometimes we use more and sometimes we use less. And 
I don't know. Like, you can figure it out. Like, make something up. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you with that one. Like, you got it. Construct 4.3.S1, construct a diagram of a carbon cycle. We definitely just did that, and we just looked at it. So refer back to that if you want to know. Pool is going to be where there is a lot of carbon in one place. Flux is when a lot of this carbon in one pool moves to another pool. So an example of carbon flux would be a lot of carbon in the atmosphere moving to the ocean from one pool, the atmosphere, to another, the ocean. What we looked at was a terrestrial carbon cycle, but an aquatic carbon cycle would basically be the same thing except it's underwater. And instead of the atmosphere be being the sink, the ocean would be. 4.4.U1, carbon dioxide and water vapor are the most significant greenhouse gases. So we talked about this a little bit in class, and I actually think she did an okay time explaining it, but I'm going to go over it very briefly instead, or just in case. We don't often think of water vapor as a greenhouse gas, but because it, it contains those long form waves and holds them in the atmosphere really well, just like carbon dioxide, and there's so much water vapor in the atmosphere, there's actually going to be, it's going to be more significant than something like methane, which might come third, right? So the sources of CO2 are what we just talked about, like we're burning, we're cutting down all our forests and burning all our coal. Yes, there's going to be a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Water vapor is just going to get up there through natural means and not come down because heating up the earth, baby, heating up the earth. It's just a vicious cycle. The mechanisms by which greenhouse gases trap heat in the atmosphere is, so there are basically going to be two types of waves coming from the sun. Short waves, which go down quickly, and it's going to go down and bounce back out, and it's going to be great, and long form waves, which are going to go in touch the ground and bounce back up, but instead of being able to go back out, they're going to be trapped by this carbon dioxide and water vapor. And that's kind of not gonna let those long form waves bounce back out of the atmosphere like the short form waves did. So instead they'll just kind of be bouncing back and forth and not be able to get out. And maybe every once in a while they'll get out, but because there is so much CO2 and so much water vapor, it's kind of like if someone had you wear three masks at one time and said, okay, breathe, you'd have a pretty hard time doing it because there's so much blocking your way. And that's kind of the same thing that these long form, longer wave radiation is going through. And that's kind of what the rest of this area right here is talking about. But since I kind of just went over it, we're gonna scroll right through here and move on to 5.3.U4. Now we're getting into the harder stuff, for me at least. What did I put here? Oh, no, this is the right thing. I'm so smart. <laughs> uh, so all organisms are going to be classified into three do domains, archaea, eubacteria, and eukaryote. And we're going to talk about the differences. Now, to be honest, I don't really have a great grasp on the differences, but let's look at this nifty little chart I found online to explain the differences. So if I remember correctly, we are all going to be eukaryotes. All plants and animals, I think, are eukaryotes. And... That's because we have DNA replication, transcription, translation, all the cool stuff that we kind of need to, uh, you know, reproduce and such, that we need to reproduce and stuff. We're going to have a nucleus, we're going to have organelles, we're going to have telomeres, like all these fun things. I know. Thrilling! And our metabolism, I know this is going to be shocking, is going to be eukaryotic. So eukaryotes are really the, the more defined of the two. So if you have to explain one, I would choose eukaryotes and explain how we do cell division 
in order to reproduce, like our process of, of DNA transcription and replication and like all of that fun stuff is all going to be very specifically eukaryotic. One other thing that's going to be different for each of them is going to be our chromosome shape. So eukaryotes, as we're still talking about, are going to have a linear chromosome shape. And if you think about the chromosomes, like we kind of picture them in our head, the X and the Y and the, the straight line little doodads, they're all going to be straight. Whereas the archaea are going to be circular and the eubacteria or the bacteria is going to be mostly circular. Uh, the, arche the archaea is going to be kind of eukaryotic-like with its DNA replication, transcription, translation, eukaryotic-like, but not exactly the same. Same with its metabolism. It's going to be bacterial-like. So eukaryotes really sit in the middle, and their defining factor, I think, is they're going to have glycerol 1-phosphate as the phosphate backbone of lipids, whereas the other two are going to have glycerol 3-phosphate. And they're also going to have ether... Does that say ether? It might. Ether carbon linkage of lipids. That's going to be the other, the other thing that defines them. And then obviously bacteria is literally going to have bacterial metabolism. None of that cell crap that we got going on, neither of them will have any of that cell crap that we got going on, none of that nucleus, organelle, blah, blah, blah. Bacteria, again, are going to have mostly circular chromosomal shapes, and it's going to have bacterial DNA repl replication, transcription, translation, whereas the other two are eukaryotic and eukaryotic-like. So again, I would just, I guess, keep in mind that glycerol 1 phosphate for archaea, the eukaryotic metabolism for eukaryotes, and the mostly circular, circular, and linear chromosome shape, respectively. Let's move on before I confuse us all even more there. The 5.3.U5 states that the principal taxa for classifying eukaryotes, so again, these are the plants, these are the animals, this is the stuff we know about the most, are kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So we are going to say this like three times right now, and I want you to open your mouth and read it off the page with me, and by the last one, try and close your eyes and say it on your own. Still with me, but this is going to help us memorize it, because I believe this is going to be the hierarchy of taxa from largest to smallest. So let's, let's try it together, all right? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Again, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And a third time, Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And this is going to be the list of taxa from largest to smallest. She does not have scientific names or the binomial system highlighted on here, so for now I'm not going to go over binomial nomenclature, but in the future I might. But since it doesn't look like we'll need it for this specific test, I'm going to skip it. Moving on down to 5.3.A2, a3, and A4, I'm going to go over to the textbook pages she was looking at us in class, but I'm hopefully going to explain it a little bit better than she did. First, let's look at the four different types of plants that we've got going on. So plants are all classified together in one kingdom, because again, we've got kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Let's see how many times we can say that and see if we can say it like seven times fast so that we all have it memorized and it'll be great. So I'm going to mess up the, spell, the pronunciation of these, and that's how you're going to remember them, because I'm not going to know what I'm saying. Brypheta is going to be mosses. So, like, mosses, liverworts, hornworts, just remember moss, and, like, you'll remember the others, right? So these are not going to have any true roots. They're not going to have any xylem or phloem. They're not true trees or shrubs. Pollen isn't produced, they've got no ovaries or ovules, they've got no seeds, and they've got no fruits. So basically, they've got nothing going on, right? But these are like the mosses, so if you think about it, that makes sense. Like, you could just go out and pick up a rock and it's got moss on it, but it's got no roots or xylem or phloem or 
They're not trees. They're not shrubs. They don't make fruit. They don't have pollen. Like, none of that crap. Next, we've got Phyllocenophyta, which is going to be ferns. So you can all think of a picture of a fern in your head. These do have roots, stems, or leaves, usually. They do have a xylem and a phloem. So unlike the Brytophyta or the mosses, Brytophyta, Brytophyta, whatever. Um, I'm losing my mind. However, still not, not true. Trees and shrubs, they're ferns. They don't have pollen. They don't have ovaries or ovules. They don't have seeds. They don't have fruits. They are ferns. They do have roots and stems. They do have xylem and phloem. They don't have any of the other stuff. Conifera, coniferophyta are going to be conifers. These are going to be like pine trees, but I like the word conifers, so I'm going to use that. And so these do usually have root stems and or leaves. They do have xylem and phloem. The cells between, they are technically true trees slash shrubs. They are producing pollen in male cones. The ovules are produced in female cones. They do have pollen, they do have ovules, and they do have seeds. However, they still do not have fruits. So again, let's go over this one more time really quick. Roots, stems, leaves, yes. Xylem, phloem, yes. They are true trees slash shrubs. They do have pollen, they do have ovules, they do do have seeds, they do not have fruits. So what does have fruits? There's going to be the anvio, angiosperm phyta, spermophyta. And these are going to be our flowering plants. So root stems, leaves, yes. Xylem, phloem, yes. They are true trees slash shrubs. Pollen is produced in the anther, anthers in the flowers, and ovules are enclosed inside the ovaries in the flowers. They do have seeds, and they do have fruits. So again, Try and remember this table best you can. Try and remember them in order as they're adding on. But most importantly, remember the one that starts with B is going to be the mosses. F is going to be the ferns. Conifer is going to be the conifers. And angiospermo is going to be our flowering plants. And you should have a pretty good idea and be able to place in your head a little bit what they have and do not have. Moving right along to the animal phyla, this is a little bit more complicated because animals are actually divided up into 30, which is too many. So let's just talk about the six that they have outlined here. Porifera. This is going to be our sponges. They have pores. Sponges have pores. Remember them that way. And this is me studying with you. So I'm repeating stuff like this because this is how I'm going to remember them. They don't have a mouth or an anus. They don't have symmetry. They have skeletal needles, but they don't have much else. And they have pores. Snip, snidaria is going to be like our jellyfish and our coral and our sea anemones. So, CNI. CNI is going to be our jellyfish, coral, sea anemone, like whatever that situation is. They have a mouth only. They have radial symmetry, so if you look at them in a circle, they're all going to have symmetry in a circle. They're going to have a soft skeleton, but hard corals are going to secrete CaCO3, which isn't that important, so we're ignoring it. They're going to have soft skeletons. And they have tentacles arranged in rings. So really, let's just pick out what we need to remember from these. So porifera have zero symmetry, and they, have, they are the sponges with lots of pores. Snidaria is going to be like our jellyfish, coral, sea anemone, and they're going to have radial symmetry. Platyhelminthes is going to be... That looks like platypus to me. So that's what I'm going to say. There are flatworms, our tapeworms. They're going to be soft with no blood system, which is interesting. And they're going to be flat and thin ribbons. So that is, again, the one that starts with pla. Pla is going to be flatworms, tapeworms, soft ribbon. Mollusca, which is going to be our snails, our squid, our octopus. 
most have shells, but not all of them have shells because squids and octopus don't have shells. Our Annelida is going to be our like leeches type situation. They have an internal cavity with fluid under pressure. So that's kind of weird. I don't know really. They have ring segments. I guess that's also important. Is the Annelida have ring segments? And the Anthropoda are going to be our insects. They are going to have an external skeleton. So again, really quickly, let's just run through these one more time so we have them down. Porifera, pores, sponges. Next. Snideria is going to be jellyfish, corals, blah, 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 sea anemones. They have radial symmetry. Platyhelminthes are the flatworms, tapeworms. They have flat and thin bodies. Mollusca is going to be like snails, squids, octopus. They usually have shells, but not, all, not always. Annelida is going to be like our leeches, and they have many ring segments. And the Anthropoda are going to have external skeletons, and those are like our insects. So then, the last thing that we have in the textbook that we're going to be looking at today is going to be the difference between amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. What else did they want us to look at here? Birds, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, snakes, yeah and fish. So I think we generally like, I don't need to tell you the difference between a freaking bird and a mammal, but let it, let's just, let's talk about it anyways, I guess, just to cover it. Um, I mean, honestly, like, do we really need to? You can see, you, you advise, you can read this, you can screenshot this if you want to screenshot it and look at it on your own time. I'm not going over this because I think, I think you can freaking figure out if it's a reptile or a fish, okay? I have faith in you. Oh, <laughs> I'm... Draw a molecular diagram of glucose ribose. So, before I pull up the picture, I want you to seriously get out a piece of paper right now, pause the video, and try drawing it on your own, okay? This is, I hope you're doing that right now. Welcome back. Uh, <laughs> I hope you drew that uh, seriously because it is important to do this on your own. So before we even look at the picture to kind of kind of show you that maybe I maybe know what I'm doing with these. The glucose is going to be alpha glucose and the ribose is just going to be ribose. The alpha glucose is going to have six sides whereas the ribose is only going to have five. With the ribose the oxygen is going to be on the top. With the alpha glucose it's going to be on the top right. Yeah, let's, uh, let's take a look here. So this is going to be our ribose. I did that one first. So again, one, two, three, four, five sides with the oxygen at the top. The OH group on the right side is going to be upwards, and both of the OH groups on the bottom are going to be downwards. And again, both the glucose and the ribose are going to have CH2O2, OH, CH2OH. Okay. So again, the OH group on the right hand side is going to be upwards. All of the, both of the other OH groups are going to be downwards and we're gonna have that CH2OH. Next, if we look at the glucose, this is going to be, again, six sided, one, two, three, four, five, six. All of the OH groups, except for the one on the bottom left, all of the rest of them are going to be downwards and the one on the bottom left is going to be upwards. That oxygen is going to be opposite from that OH group that's going to be pointing upwards. And again, that similar spot right there, we're going to have the CH2OH group. And that is going to be the same for all of them. So I know that's kind of a, an awkward like number or letter thing to memorize. If you can memorize that and remember it basically goes in the same spot for both the ribose and the glucose, then you'll be set. You'll be doing good. And again, all of the OH groups are going to be pointed downwards except for alpha glucose. This one right here on the bottom left is going to be upwards. For beta glucose, it's going to be down. Alpha glucose, it's up. So, lastly, she wants us to be able to identify 
sugars from molecular drawings. I'm not going over that. I think if you want to go over that, you can Google those pictures and memorize them on your own time. That's just, we are like almost done, I promise. 2.3.1, monosaccharide monomers are linked together by condensation reactions. So again, condensation links them together to form disaccharides and polysaccharides. Monosaccharides is going to be 1, 1. Disaccharide is going to be 2. Poly is going to be 3. They're being linked together through condensation or dehydration reactions. Three examples of monosaccharides are going to be listing them off the top of my head. Glucose, ribose, and galactose. Three examples of disaccharides is going to be sucrose, lactose, and maltose, or maltose. And three examples of polysaccharides are going to be cellulose, starch, and glycogen. If you want to go ahead and memorize those same nine that I just said, I think it's a great idea to just have those nine down. They're pretty much the most common. If you can show maltose forming, that's also important. So for maltose, the thing that's going to be important with that is that the CH2OH group is going to be flipping top and bottom every time because of the way that the glucoses are going to be connecting because it's going to be glucose, 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 glucose. So they're going to flip up and down and up and down and up and down. And they're farthest, the, the points that you would imagine are connecting are the ones that are connecting. So that is going to be carbon one and carbon four, I believe. Carbon 1 and 4, and the CH2OH group is going to be flipping every time. Explain a condensation reaction connecting two monosaccharides in the formation of a disaccharide. disaccharide. Condensation, condensation, condensation. Think if you had a drink right next to you, and it is hot and the drink is cold. What would you see on the outside? Condensation, because the water is coming out. Condensation, coming out. The easiest way to draw this is like draw two little circles and then an arrow and then boom, H2O and the two circles are combined now. Condensation, 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 okay? 2.3.A1, structure and function of cellulose and starch in plants and glycogen in huma humans. We've already discussed briefly the structural difference between alpha and beta glucose. For alpha glucose, that OH group on the bottom right is going to be up, and for beta, it's going to be down like the rest of the OH groups. And then the structure and function of cellulose, amylose, am amylopectin, and glycogen. Again, I have faith that you can Google these things if you want to. I don't feel the need to go over them especially. She also gave us a worksheet with those on there if you want to look at that, which, not a bad idea. Identification of biochemical lipids. I'm not going over this because I don't, I don't really know them. Like, uh, they'll probably be important and I'll probably come back to this video and be like, darn, well, if only I had thought about this a little more, but... There's only so much information you can cram in your head the night before, and I think this is one of the more difficult things that it's maybe not worth the time. Fatty acid, 2.3.U2, fatty acids can be saturated, monounsaturated, or polyunsaturated. And again, this is going to be saturated is, my fish is being so dumb right now. I love him, but he's an idiot. Sorry. Saturated is going to mean that there is one hydrogen for every carbon. So if you think of, of drawing one of these situations, I can, I can maybe, maybe not. Um, if you draw a line of C's and connect them, if it is saturated, that means that you are going to have one H group on the top and one H on the top and on the bottom of every single of those carbons that you just drew. Monounsaturated means that there is one double bond and polyunsaturated means that there is more than one double bond. 
And moving on to 2.3.U3, cis and trans. So cis is going to mean that the H group is both going to be on the same side, and that's going to mean that they're kinked. What do I mean by kink? That's just the little bend. It's the easiest way that I can help you to remember if there is a kink or not, if it's cis or trans. If the H's are both next to each other, they're going to want to separate a little bit and it's going to kink up, okay? Trans is unnatural. So this is something that humans have made. And this means that the H groups are actually going to be on opposite sides. So instead of, so again, unsaturated means that there's not enough H's. When these H's are next to each other, there's going to be a kink and that's going to be cis. When they're on opposite sides of each other, when there's a space next to one on the top and space next to the other on the bottom, that's going to be trans and there's going to be no kink because there's going to be no reason to bend. Moving along, phospholipids form bilayers in water. I honestly, I'm going to totally skip the fluid mosaic model. If you want to go back through and watch the other video I did on phospholipids and the fluid mosaic model, I recommend it if you feel the need to get more practice with that. I don't feel the need to talk about this again. So you know, there's only three videos on this channel. I have confidence you can find it. Uh, but it was week one was that video. Cholesterol is a component of animal cell membranes. I talked about this in the fluid model membrane. Go, go watch that video if you're still confused. Like, you got it. I will talk like for a few seconds here about the falsification of the Davidson Danielli model because I'm not sure how deeply I covered that in the other video. So freeze-etched electron micrograph images is going to be those pictures that you Google. If you Google that term, you're going to find a bunch of pictures. And basically what it's showing is that there's little dimples and little dots on freeze etch, which just means a frozen cell that was cut through the bilayer. And those dimples show that the proteins are going through that bilayer, which previously the Davidson Danielli model thought that there was this bilayer that we still know exists, but they thought that there was a structured layer of proteins on both sides of that bilayer. But the fact that the proteins went through on this freeze-etched electron micrograph shows that they weren't on the outside. Cell fusion is, again, when we had that mouse cell and that human cell. We dyed one green, we dyed one red, we smashed them together, and after about 40 minutes, all of those proteins were mixed together. Which happens because, again, those proteins are not frozen in place as we previously thought them to be, and they do mix and move and hop around and skip and jump and have a merry little time. And finally, I the last thing I'm going to talk about is the fact that proteins are now known to have a phos uh, hydrophilic and a hydrophobic area, which in the past, because the heads of all the phospholipids are all hydrophilic, meaning water-loving, we would have thought that the entire protein, which again, we thought to be stuck on the outside, we would have thought that this protein would be entirely hydrophilic because it's attached to the hydrophilic heads and the water. But because there is a hydrophobic part of these proteins, that means that there has to be some part that's not touching the heads and the water. And then I've kind of talked about it briefly, but the main thing, the main difference between the two models is protein fluidity and just fluidity in general. The fact that the proteins aren't stuck in place as we thought they were with the Davison Danielli model. Yeah, I think that's everything. I think I'm just going to stop now before I over explain things and confuse everyone. I hope this was helpful. If you have questions, I urge you to message me and ask. And if I can't answer, I urge you to message Dr. Texel, if nothing else, just to say that you did. That's, that's all I have for us today. I hope this was helpful. Uh, good luck on the test. We can do it. Okay.
That's good.